Animation director and college instructor David Brain found his way into the animation business via a well-traveled route. He became an in-betweener at Walt Disney Productions when The Jungle Book was in work, and he learned the business from the ground up. Walt himself shook Dave's hand and said that they were looking and needing new blood at the studio, and he hoped that he would be part of the new breed. The animation business was small and fluid in the 1960s, and Dave found himself working in all corners of it during a 40-plus year career. He was an animator on Hot Wheels in the 1960s, a story director on Yogi Bear cartoons in the 1970s, and a director and supervisor on DuckTales, The Transformers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Garfield, among numerous others, in the 1980s and 1990s. Dave remained active as a director straight into the 21st century and today teaches college in the San Fernando Valley. We spoke at the Animation Guild on January 19, 2012. Did, you got interested in, in art and illustration fairly early on. How, how, did you, how did you end up finding your way into animation, but more specifically when you were a kid and in high school, uh, where uh, where did you see your career as going? Well, I don't think any of us thought about careers. This is all in retrospect, you know. I, I had a very good friend who was a really good basketball player. And uh, three years after high school, he was playing for John Wooden at UCLA. Wow. Um, did he go pro? No, no. He had a deviated septum, and uh, the doctor said, you know, finish your UCLA career and that's it. And he played in the Maccabee games. Because he couldn't, because he couldn't probably get it up. Yeah, yeah. Endurance and breath. Yeah, yeah. So you, uh, you ended up finding your way to Chenard. Yeah, and he said, man, where did you learn to draw like that? And I said, well, it's just, it's interesting. I, and, uh, you know, back when you're writing uh, in doing things uh, just to kill time, uh, I would uh, try to draw perspective problems. For kicks. And this was in high school? Yeah, uh, even junior high. Really? Yeah, yeah. What kind of stuff did you draw? Well, I would draw canyons and rivers, um, buildings at angles. I'd seen them in comic books, and i duplicate them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the fellows just said, hey, that's interesting. How do you do that? Or, uh, well, and I said, well, you just uh, you notice that this is this. And other fellows, I had another friend, Barry Riker, who was... Uh, mathematician and in his senior year he was doing problems that were sent to him from Stanford wow his father got him in a program prodigy so I, I, I learned about from when I was a parent myself just help your kids guide your kids to what they seem to want to do anyway. and you were an LA kid right did you grow up I was in LA? yeah I, I moved from the Bay Area I was born up there but I moved here when I was 10 years old so you had grown up in the valley yeah in North Hollywood yeah I went to Van Nuys High School because they needed kids more than North Hollywood High did, but back in the day, yeah, yeah, that was uh, very late fifties. So you got you got into Chenards as an eighteen year old, nineteen year old. I was seventeen. Yeah, uh, I had a three month summer break, and then uh, my mother uh, said, "Well, go down there and try this. Show me your portfolio." She drove me downtown. Um, she said she had to go buy some music. She was a musician. Yeah. And she drove me by Chenard, and she said, oh, yeah, here it is. Let's get some drawings out. And she walked me in, and I had a little interview. And they said, we would admit you in the fall. You just show enough interest here. And initially you were telling me that you, your, your goal was to be an illustrator. That's right, yeah. The kind of things I was doing in the portfolio were drawings of people, a little, you know, ink and wash paintings of people. Landscapes, illustrations. Yeah, landscapes, yeah. And I had been taking watercolor classes intermittently for about four years. Oh, okay. When so you were moving could round me up and shoot me off that way. And then you were telling me at lunch. So what happened? You get into the program, and you get two years into the program, and yeah. then uh, The first year at Chenard is the same for everyone. It's a lot of basic drawing, painting, and design. Uh, the second year... Uh, you get a couple of classes that are in the major you've declared for. Right. And I had a, a beginning um, illustration class. Yeah. Uh, where they'd have us, they give us an assignment the way you'd get it from an art director. Yeah. And we'd do a rough, submit it to them at the end of the week. 
to our teacher. He'd say what he liked and disliked and uh, go to a finish. Um, and uh, at the end of two years, at that time, Chenard had a program, uh, a review. They wouldn't admit you into upper division unless uh, they felt there was a chance for you to really do something. And they told me, um, your illustration work is very uninspired. It's all right. We like your drawing, your basic drawing, a lot better than... We uh, like your illustration And we don't think shots. you're that interested in it. And I said, well, I really admire, uh, you know, and I la named a lot of the names of the current illustrators, uh, Bernie Fuchs and the, and the Parker brothers and all those people that are our heroes, you know. Yeah. And they, and they said, well, but those are the people who are famous now. If you're going to be uh, important in illustration, you're going to have to do something that's not being done now. Right. And we don't see that in your work. Not at all. And then the teacher said, you know, are you writing a comedy column in the, in the school newspaper? We had a paper that came out once, once a month. I think you unfolded the thing. It folded down and folded out to be a poster side. And it was all writing, but it was short comedy writing, and I enjoyed that. Always had it. Enjoyed comedians, collected their albums. Um, and she said, why don't you transfer to USC? It looks like you like to do writing more than... And I do. I, to this day, I love to do writing, and I write to people and do oh, small things. Thing I write about, obituaries. Uh, Corny Cole. <laughs> yeah. Um, but an avocation. Uh, I did like to draw, too. And they said, well, why don't you go to our animation program. It was a very small program. I think they had eight people in a lab uh, for two years, up for two years. And, it was uh, embryonic in those days, probably, right? Uh, yes, yeah. They had just... Elmer Plummer was a teacher, but um, he was withdrawing, and so they brought in T. He. Now, now how was T. He as a teacher? Well, he was, uh, he was all right. He, he's... The, the program at that time was sitting around a table and talking about what you wanted to do. That's the way Elmer Plummer ran it. So T did that, sat at the table, and when he found out what we wanted to do, it kind of shows we wanted to do, he went out and got uh, his friends, the best editor he knew. Uh, he got Bob Cannon and Ozzy Evans to teach us animation, Rudy LaRiva to teach us direction and timing. Wow. Uh, these great guys. Uh, uh, Lou Keller was a storyboard artist, one of the main guys at um, Jay Ward at that time. Um, and we started to really produce stuff. They were pushing us, and we produced stuff. Now, you, that's really the kind of class they now run out of Cal Arts, where you have a lot of mentors that come out and work with the students. And that program sort of started at Chenard's and then sort of transferred yeah. over. T and transferred out there and, and with the program and, and he later worked retired. There for, he worked there for a number of years, I yeah. think, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he had directed Pinocchio and yeah, been one of the sequence directors. directors and yeah. He had the, the great film Rudy Toot Toot, the UPA picture, was his direction. And he was a mover and shaker at yeah. the UPA as well. Yeah. yeah. Now, you did, while you were at Chenard's, you did a thing which uh, has found life on... YouTube, which is uh, uh, the stop-motion motorcycle films, and what's the deal with that? How well, did we, that did, we did motorcycles. Uh, we did people sliding on their butts as if they were automobiles, sports cars. We even did a couple with horseback riding where we had we jumped in the air. And these are live action. They're live actions, stop motion, single frame. They can't click, move, click, move, click, move. Um, what we did, uh, we all. When we, at Chenard, we would... At, this was a bunch of you at Chenard, yeah, this, right? Uh, yeah, there was Charlie Swenson, Jim Duffy, um, uh, Len Jansen, Chuck Menville, John Gibbs, Bob Richardson. A lot of guys that were in the yeah, business for years yeah. and years. Uh, and the three of us, uh, Jansen, Menville, and I, and I, maybe I had a little camera experience, so T said, y you fellas want to make a film out of this thing? Because we love Laurel and Hardy. Right. And they said, I, I don't think you guys could make a... You know, those are vaudeville guys. They had to work years to get the kind of skill they had. He said, but you could do stop motion. And uh, he showed us uh, the Norman McLaren film, Stop Motion. Oh, okay. He says, because this allows you to plan, to storyboard and plan, and then execute the game. So he sort of suggested the stop motion angle. So we took the kind of Laurel and Hardy's gag story 
and used uh, the techniques that we observed in McLaren's work and came up with stop motion uh, animated characters in a real world. Um, They're hysterical. Yeah, yeah. They, and you were the cameraman on. Right? I was. We'd write them together, but of course, a lot of the gags, like the old, the old silent days, were made up on the uh, set, using what you know the location you were at. So you were you were uh, being a gag man and the cameraman for, yeah, for yeah. all these stop motion films. Yeah, and Lynn Jansen was always the villain, and Chuck was always the hero because they had those kinds of faces. And later they became a writing team at H and B and Filmation. And, yeah. Went on and yeah. on and on. So you get through Chenards, yeah, in their anim in their animation mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. and then the government comes and kindly uh, offers you a, a right. position the with position the armed with forces. The, yes, that's and that right. lasts for two years, and then mm -hmm. you drop back into Burbank after your military stint and uh, talk about your early days because your first job was at Disney, right? It, it was, yeah. I had written an application and left it with a gate guard uh, before I went in the service. And the way things roll slow, <clears throat> about three weeks before the end of the service, they, I get a letter with a Mickey Mouse in the corner. <laughs> Please come and see us at your earliest possible convenience. And uh, when I got there... And, and this is like February of 66, January? Yeah, yeah, early 66. I was actually technically still in the service... But I had a 30-day leave time at the end of my two-year term, so I just went home early. And I, I remember I had to call on the last day of my leave uh, the, uh, the, the duty officer at the old post I was at back in Alabama to tell him I was alive, I was all right. And you're leaving for good. And that's it. And then hang the phone up and I'm out of the Army, except for a National Guard, which nobody had to attend because... Uh, movie, not, movie not stars and athletes. <laughs> no. At any rate, so um, you plunge into Disney. Yeah, Andy Engman said we've got some fellows that you went to school with working here, and they said that you're getting out of the service. So somebody gave me an address, and I sent you the letter. I said, hey, thanks very much, because they really lean on you to re-enlist, and they start waving pictures of Mustangs in front of you that you could buy with your re-enlistment bonus. Right. You would have been doing a second stint oh. in Southeast Asia. Well, I would, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what would have happened. But I don't think I would have done that, but it sure was nice to have that letter yeah. <laughs> saying, come to see us. And so I did. And uh, uh, after uh, I had to work at WED for two months, they held a slot for me uh, at, in the bullpen, the training bullpen at Disney. But it wasn't open at that time. Somebody was in that seat. So they put me at WED, and I loaded, unloaded trucks, uh, drove cars to the car wash, rode that bicycle around. Uh, Be a delivery boy, yeah. a mail boy. Yeah. I went over and saw when they were that. putting uh, Meet Mr. Lincoln together. I got to see the, the innards of Mr. Lincoln. Well, they put the Mr. Lincoln skin on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, then the this, this slot opened up in the uh, training bullpen, and uh, two months there, and they put me on production. At the TV show, uh, two months there. It, this is just as an in-betweener, but right, you're a down, line that you're they down on the bottom. Yeah, but and I you're can in-betweening. Yeah, and uh, you were there through all of '66 into '67. So yeah. you, you were talking about having a few conversations with Walt in the last year of his life. Yeah, um, the first time. Uh, a bunch of us were sitting outside having a cigarette break. We sm everyone smoked in those days. It wasn't bad for you. That's right. <laughs> it, was a health, it was a health practice. Walt smoked himself. Walt comes out with Willie Reitherman, his director, right. to the front of the animation building, and we all kind of, what do we do? You know, so we just, Break up. just smile high and kept working our cigarettes. And uh, Willie says, they're supposed to be here, Walt. I don't know what happened. Uh, some... Visiting dignitaries were oh. coming from the main gate, so here we are. Nothing to do. He's got. They've arrived early, so Walt says, "Willie, uh, are these some of the new boys?" And he says, "Yeah, I think they are." And uh, he says, "Well, introduce me to them." Well, he didn't know us from Adam, you know. Right. <laughs> so he goes to Chuck Menville, who's the closest. He says, "I'm forgotten your first name," and Chuck says, "Chuck Chuck Menville." He says, "Introduce the rest of the boys to Walt." So. We all shook hands. So and he gets around <laughs> having to remember names. Yeah. 
Um, but we took the lesson. You know, I've used that several times myself later on. Sure. And remember, just contact one person and let them do the if work. If you're halfway there with one, then you can have him carry out for the other. Um, and then it was a short conversation until the bankers, you know, these are the important, he just said, these are important days, you know, learn from the, these men, they're not going to be here forever, and we're going to need you, we're going to need you down the line, you know. That was a couple of minutes. But the second time, um, we were uh, sneaking over to watch Dick Van Dyke and Edward G. Robinson, I really loved, oh, yeah. work on a movie, and um, we were, the, the bell, the, the hot set bell, when uh, light went off, the which red meant light was on. we could go in, and uh, we started to push the door, and somebody was pushing on the other side. So <laughs> we said they must have put something in front of the door. Said, Sometimes they do that. So we said, well, just we'll just push it out of the way. So we started to win the push contest, and when we stuck our head around the corner, it was Walt on the other side trying to get out. <laughs> yeah, trying to get out, and uh, and. Uh, Chuck Medville said, it's not a sandbag. I said, well, what is it? He says, it's Walt. <laughs> so I said, we're sorry, we're sorry. I said, oh, that's all right, boys. Uh, this is break time. Yes, it's just about over, but, uh, and we ducked out. Walt, uh, the, the films we were working on the weekend, uh, John Kimball was working with us, and he said, you should show these to my dad. So those were the motorcycle the little stop, things, yeah, the right? motorcycle thing. Actually, it was uh, sliding on our butts. You were the moving. Car. You were sort of embroidering on the things that you had done at Chenard's. Yes, yeah, we were reshooting, but this time we were boarding and uh, making it longer. Um, and it got a nomination. It lost to another film, but we actually got an Oscar nomination wow. for that picture. And you shot that on 16 or on 35? On 16 millimeter, yeah, on 16. And then blew it up? Did you blow it up to 35? We did, yeah, yeah. And you can see the grain a little bit. Um, but uh, it was kind of Kimball said... Uh, that's right. He said, show this to my dad. So we showed it to... Uh, Ward. Ward, when it was finished work print, silent. And he said, uh, let's see if it gets you some sound on this. And I said, well, we've been thinking about that. We're going to try to make... He says, let me... Let me talk to Walt. And um, about a week later, we got a call to go to Walt's office, the three yeah. of us. Wow. And he said, this is a nice a nice little picture you're doing. So he had seen it. Yeah. They'd, we'd left it with uh, Ward, and he'd shown it to Walt. And they said, we're going to give you an editing room and, uh, and a key to the uh, sound booth. Now, you can't do this during work hours, but you have some dinner and then come back at 7 o'clock and you can uh, edit at night. So we put, you know, laid in six soundtracks, really wow. nice sound. That's what got us a nomination. Because when you see these funny little characters moving around, but really the sound, sound really effects. sells it. When they, yeah. Um, we were going to get a free mix, too, at the end of it all. But by that time, Walt had died. They gave us the mix because we were scheduled. And then they set us a bill for it. <laughs> oh, good. Because Walt yeah. wasn't there anymore. <laughs> he would have given you a freebie. Yeah, it would have been a freebie. You know, I went up to the Disney Library just last year. Yeah. And Walt said, you know, this is great. You're taking the incentive. I rem he mentioned something about this is the way I started, you know, just be using my weekends. And he, yeah. was, he was impressed by all of that. Well, initiative usually yeah. is impressive. Especially when I went to the library, it was the first time, the Disney library up in San Francisco, that I saw some of the footage he had shot, pictures of uh, stills from the, that he was doing on the weekend when he was living in Kansas City. Yeah. Shooting things. Same, same stuff. So he had a personal identification with what we were doing, and that's what got us his help. So they say a lot of different things about Walt Disney, but that's well my experience with him. Yeah. Now... <laughs> Moving on from that, Walt yeah. passed away, and uh, you're working on the Jungle Book, right? Yes. And yeah. you finished that up probably in the spring of uh, '67, early '67. So. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you were off to a new studio at that. Point? Yes, we were getting the layoffs were coming down two or three a day for anybody who hadn't been at yeah. the studio for ten years or so. Yeah. Because they just didn't have the work. And you used to go to Andy's. 
Engman's office, get your pink slip, go back to your office, start cleaning out, and you get a phone call. Yeah. And it would be either Hanna-Barbera or um, the Patty Freely saying, C come and see us. <laughs> and I said, how did they know? <laughs> Andy sent out, sent out yeah, messages. Yeah, Andy was right? telling people, you can have these guys. We don't need them now. So that was pretty friendly, too. That was the old days, I guess. I don't well, the industry was smaller and yeah. friendlier. And so I went to the Patty Freely as an um, uh, assistant animator. A yeah. nice little pay jump. And, oh, uh, yeah, that yeah. would have been good. Yeah. So what did you work on uh, at the Patty Freeling? Did you work with Frizz? And what they say, they're listed, I think, um, as some of the worst animated films ever made. I worked with, well, Frizz wasn't personally involved in this stuff. He was doing the Pink Panthers, Aardvark and Ants, those things. We, we had two uh, series, TV series shows, uh, Spy Shadow and Super President. Yeah. And neither one of those are... Actually, they're shown now just for their curiosity. You know, <laughs> how strange they are. Um, but it introduced me to the TV production uh, system. And by uh, this time, you were assistant animating and animating? Not animating yet. No, no. Um, I finished a year there, and then um, Hanna Barbera called the next season before De Patty Freeling. So I went to work there, and I was sitting in a bullpen with a bunch of people, great friends. But the work was driving me nuts. It was shift and trace work. Um, uh, you know, tr tracing Evo's uh, models, Evo Takamoto's models, and then another model and trying to get it to move. They didn't want any creative input at all. Just use a layout from just, another scene. Just move the character. Move production, yeah. And how much footage did they want out of you in a week? You know, Quite I, a bit, 70, yeah, yeah, 80 I think feet so. a week. Yeah. So you cranked. Yeah, yeah. And we did all the mouth libraries. Yeah, mouth libraries. And I said, boy, this isn't, this isn't any fun. Uh, but I would have kept doing it, except a friend of mine, Chuck Swenson, was down at Murakami Wolf, uh, and he called and he said, we need an assistant down here, and you'll be working on maybe a different commercial every week. They were very busy. And six months later, uh, after working with them, my Vince Davis, they got, he got hired there too, they were starting to give us small animation assignments, parts of commercials. So this yeah. is your first animation? Yeah, yeah. So this is like 68, 69? Yes. And uh, we realized that we needed to know a lot more than we, we did. And uh, Fred and Jimmy really couldn't teach us everything we needed to know. Yeah. They, had, they knew a certain style of animation. And the Producers Association, I'm not quite sure who, started some classes, uh, an advanced animation. Uh, you submitted a reel of work you'd done yeah. to get in the class, and we did that. Mark Kauser was in there, and Bob Richardson, John Gibbs, Vince Davis, myself. All the guys that uh, went on and on and on. And they got so many people that they divided us into three groups. One group uh, reported and learned from uh, Abe Levito, the other group from Hal Ambro, and the third from Irv Spence. Out at, uh, so what group were you with? I was with... Uh, Levito to begin with, and then I went to Hal Ambro. Yeah, now Ambro is one of the great unsung yeah. Disney animators. I mean, I've had many people tell me you know, he was as good as any of the nine old men, but got there too late to yeah. be in one of the yeah. chosen chairs, so he ended up being, you know... The irony is, when I was animating on the Black Cauldron, um, I'm working with these rats that live down underneath, and the boys, you know... The Taron is trying to sneak in, and he comes to all these rats, and he's got to combat them, and they're little devil, devilish rats. And I tried several things, and the work was mediocre. And uh, I, I, they, uh, they said, go look at uh, the, the library. Look at the rats, or the great rats in Lady and the Tramp, and see if you can use some of that stuff. Look at the timing. See how he did it. So I went to the library, which was uh, under the ink and paint department. Yeah. Then called the Edition. morgue. Yeah, the morgue. <clears throat> and the fellow down there ran it. Looked like he hadn't had any blood running through his system for a couple of yeah, weeks. Or seen any sun. Or yeah. Anything else. But he knew the morgue, and he got me those scenes. Uh, and I looked at them, and then I, the animator was Hal Ambrose. Yeah. <laughs> so I, well, uh, I put some of those poses in, uh, and just generally saw how he was timing the movement of those rats and uh, started getting my scenes into the picture. Wow. Yeah. So, 
What did Ambro teach you when you were taking his class, or do you remember what he emphasized or what he... Uh, the, the work, Hal took over, uh, half the people dropped out of Levithel's class, half yeah. dropped out of Hal's class. Then Abe started a company, so he couldn't do it anymore, so they pushed, put us over with uh, Hal Ambrose's class. And I had a bunch of projects, and Hal would, it was mainly just telling me to either have the character move fast or slow, get rid of drawings here or add some drawings here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the uh, variation in timing mm -hmm. that I, I was, uh, you know, and new animators are afraid to, to really make the timing too variant. He showed me, we would just tear drawings out and shoot it again. But and it made a difference. Yes, yeah. In those days, of course, you you do the timing, you set your drawings up, and they went to a camera. They came back the next day, and you got yeah. to look at it. Yeah, now yeah. we have instant reporting on our animation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very little hand drawn anymore. There's it's done here and there, but uh, yeah. Yeah. not as a general thing. It's all uh, CGI. Yeah. We have over at Woodbury where I'm teaching. We uh, we have a, a lot of hand drawing, but it gets scanned in, and the frustration there is it it goes away, it, then it has to be composited with other things and you don't get to see it to report it. But we do have a lunchbox in the room, that old uh, video testing system. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the last time I get to see the work before they're showing me the finished scenes. Off and away. Yeah. So after your classes with Ambro, what were some of your assignments? Because you you worked for like ever. Yeah, in the business as an animator, as uh, an assistant, as uh, a timing director, as a supervising director. Yeah, and and uh, I, John Kimball and I used to trade information we got about what you could do with the camera. He was a, you know, we went to school together, and we we're so you and John, who's line. Ward's, who's Ward's son. Yeah. Uh, Sort of came up in the business at the same time, then, huh? Yes, From yeah. School and and I think of all the animators, we were the two that found more fascination in what the camera could do, uh, f functioning almost as an optical printer. You know, uh, uh, hold back mats and filters and uh, second passes, but it called for mathematical uh, computation. One little story back at Disney the first time when I got out of, uh, they put me actually onto production on um, the Jungle Book. Mm -hmm. It was as a breakdown artist. That's one step up, but still not very far. And they put me in Glenn Schmidt's room. And uh, Glenn was working straight to John Lounsbury. He was Glenn a, was an assistant he was the animator assistant to John Lounsbury, to one John. of the old men. And John would bring in these panning scenes where he said, we've got to figure this out and do a rough test. But the panning has to work or else the animation rough won't look any good. And Glenn said, oh, I hate to do this stuff. I'm no good in math. I get, and I take it on to scene planning, and they'll sit on it for three, four days. So I went over and looked at it, and I, I wrote some numbers down. I said, you know, it's, it's probably your move is about this much if you've got to move this, you know, four inches in uh, three feet. Right. And then uh, we just uh, make the moves bigger in the middle and use that footage to slow it at the ends. It should work. So he... He said, well, okay, take, take these drawings over to John, and the test worked. So I became the guy that figured the pans for the rough So you, you animation. became the rough timer yeah. pan guy. Pans and trucks. Uh, and I just, I don't know, I'm not really good at math, but that kind of stuff I could figure out. Hmm. And I didn't realize that a lot of animators can't. Um, and... Uh, it's, that's so that, what led me into seeing uh, doing more things. There were several years where the bulk of my money came from simulating ani uh, computer animation movements uh, using optical printers and cameras huh. on regular artwork. Because for several years it was cheaper to do that than to, there were a lot of fancy um, computer animators. Uh, like moving through glass and this and that with glitz, glistening lines going on that the computer could do, but it was very expensive and took a lot of time. They had to write special programs for it. Yeah. Once I'd seen that, I figured out how to do that on an optical, well, on a camera, really, yeah. um, with just different elements and overloading them. 
uh, making hmm. several passes, combining them, and uh, I made, uh, for a few years, the bulk of my money exposing those kind of, and I get, I'd get called in on jobs different places. Well, to, fi to figure to out that. the mechanics. Yeah, to figure the mechanics out. It's all part of it, yeah. Well, the technology is ever changing, and so you have to change. It passed me it. by. <laughs> well, but you rode the wave for a long yeah, time. Yeah. So, so what happened after? Uh, by now, we're into the '80s. We are the mid '80s, and uh, my assignment on the the Black Cauldron finished. You went, oh, that's right. Well, first of all, you went back to Disney's <coughs> in the feature animation department. That's right. Yeah. Uh, when they were working on the Black Cauldron in the early to mid '80s, correct? Yes, um, I got kind of pushed into being my having a company of my own. Just I was working freelance, and uh, I got in with a, a fellow named Gene Weed, who uh, had a, a film production company, and he was bidding on animation, and uh, he was using Vince Davis a little bit. Vince didn't like Gene Weed; he was, he was kind of a pompous fellow. Mm -hmm. Rest his soul. Um, but I didn't have a problem with him because he was a, a, a cowboy, and I really enjoyed cowboys, and we so hit it off. So you had a rope. Yeah. And uh, he calls me one day, he says, we're going to make six uh, Geno's hamburger commercials. This is animation. Yeah, and he had no staff. And I said, well, you're going to have to hire a lot of people. He says, wait a minute, I'm not hiring anybody. You're going to start a studio. Oh. He made $50,000 to start a studio, the downstroke, to get the animation done. And so as I moved towards the end of that, I had a little office, three uh, three rooms on Yucca Boulevard. It's been a independent movie producer's building for years. Then I moved out to the valley, and I was stringing shows together. But this is about the time that uh, Bob Kurtz also opened his business, and Duck Soup was starting up. So you were one of the three new studios on the block. Yeah, but I was bidding against those two top-rate designers and losing, because <laughs> I couldn't put the kind of front presentations together. Right. But I was managed to get some stuff. Um, but I was completely independent. I'm playing my own health benefits. And in those years, uh, health plans were doubling every year. Right. Yeah. Sort of like now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since then, yeah. Well, I guess they designed some new machinery and uh, some new procedures and it all had to be paid for and it was you know out of an independent uh, uh, health plans uh, as I said I can't I can't get a bottom line that makes any sense um, I got a job uh, taking a, a, an independent job taking a, um, a steamboat willy scene a uh, works had done it was twisting the, the steamboat wheel the whistling yeah and whistling. They wanted to start that and turn it into Mickey, that scene, all in neon. So I, I got the job because I knew how to make neon on the camera with, with uh, filters and, uh, and holdback mats and everything. Uh, that put me out of Disney again. So I said hello to some old friends. I'm working away from the studio, but I'm going in to coordinate with them. And they said, when you're done with that, would you like to work on a picture? And I said, well, I've got my own company. But then I thought about it. They have a health plan. I've got, I could get back in the union and get a health plan here. Right. And, and start my pension again. And all of a sudden, instead, in that financial light, it made a lot of sense. And this is, what, 83, 82? Yeah, yeah. And I worked on Tokyo Disneyland for Dave Michener. He was the director on that. With Chuck Harvey. And uh, after that six-month stint... They put me on the Black Cauldron, hmm. um, and I worked that for about a year and a half. Came to the end of that assignment, and I was—I I had a credit on that picture as an additional animator. Yeah. Because you had to—I hadn't enough time or you enough, didn't have footage enough footage to be a full animator, but it was fine. Um, but it ended, and they hadn't started another picture yet. They had a couple of animators doing experimental stuff on. Uh, the Great Mouse Detective. Great Mouse Detective was, and then Oliver and Company. Yeah. Um, so they made me an assistant to clean up my scenes and some other scenes. I worked some, Mark Henn had some scenes with right. uh, gobs of hair on this Gurgi character and nobody could clean it up. Um, so so you they got put a couple of animators on it and we got it cleaned up because it needed follow through to make sense. And, 
And so then they were very happy. But somebody said, you know, if you work this for six months as an assistant, they they'll can cut get, you back to assistant cut your pay. pay. I said, is that, is that going to happen? He says, it's happened before. So I got a, an offer to go to Marvel as an animation director. And at that time, they were called animation directors, not timers. Later, the name changed. And it was going to be 400 a week more than animating at Disney. So I took it. I'm raising two girls. I got a house payment, all of that. Um, and John Gibbs had been taught by Jerry Chinicky how to do the timing um, that Fritz Freeling had designed yeah. for overseas work. Very precise work, uh, but you got a lot of good first take animation if you did the timing that way with all the notes. And we still did little illustration pictures, one a foot or so. Yeah. Little roughs. And, and these are on the sheets, right? When I went out there, it was like old home week. I ran into Tim Walker, Bob Alvarez, Jeff Hale, Jeff Hall. Jeff Hale was there, too. He's an Englishman. Uh, Bob Richardson. Um, All the guys that you'd come up through the ranks yeah, with and yeah. been at school with. Jansen and Menville were upstairs writing. Margaret Lesh was running the outfit. Um, and I worked there for a couple of years. And then Disney decided... You know, to open their television. Yeah, animation. Michael Eisner had shown up, and he said, "I want a TV division." Um, and uh, uh, an old friend, uh, Michael Webster, that I'd known at Murakami Wolf, was running it. So I put a call into him, and I went in there the first year. They started with just four timers. And you started, so you started at Disney <coughs> Television Animation in the first year of its existence. That's right. They didn't have a building yet. They were across the street next to the Pago Pago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Place. They were across from Disney Studios. Yeah, I remember that. I did a little freelance for them at that period of time on uh, Gummy Bears. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess they were, they were trying to get Eisner in the studio to release a Disney legend character or two. They and didn't want to, their initial thing was they didn't want any of the classic Disney characters to be... Uh, in any of the new yeah. animated shows, I think that lasted for two or three years, and then they moved they finally away had from an that. agreement that uh, they could use the nephews and Scrooge McDuck, but not Donald. And I think they even negotiated that on a three-part episode, Donald could show up, but he couldn't be there for more than ten minutes on the screen. On Ducktales. On Ducktales, and Ducktales really took off, and we started hiring people. Um, and, and that's I, really that was really the series that that seriously launched the, sh the, the studio into the big time, yeah. and you were the supervising uh, director. Yeah, I became the supervisor. Fred Wolf uh, was running the floor at that time, and he said, I'm tired of, of talking to all four of you guys. I, pick a supervisor, and I'm going to tell him what we need. What, And uh, so they held an election, and I won, because uh, Vince Davis wouldn't do it. Uh, Terry Harrison begged off. Uh, John Kimball... Uh, said Alan Zasloff said I shouldn't do it. <laughs> so you me. ended up with the popsicle stick. <laughs> yeah. So was the end? here I am with a stack of sheets every Monday, a foot and a half high, and a list of timers, and I have to find out who's going to be finished when, and it's all what supervisors do: keep the workflow going, settle the problems. Did you do any of? Uh, did, did you do any uh, directorial duties during that time, or you just basically? making sure everybody else was, or you doing both. That's right. I was copying tracks. they give me one track. I'd have to make eight or ten copies of it. I'd cut the sheets, look very roughly at the boards to see who what, and talk to each producer. Producers had their favorite timers. I had to find one that would work for them and yet keep production moving. <coughs> so that was all. I never got to do any writing so, uh, of sheets, no. The question I have about that show is the rumor that was circulating, and I was doing this job then, was that, oh, they're over budget, they're in trouble, and then the show went on the air and did huge, yeah. huge numbers. I guess they were worried because shows were costing like 150000 for a half hour, and these budgets were four fifty. Uh, and he said, they can't make any money. So they were this. three or four times what yeah. everybody... You, Everybody else was paying. And they were good-looking. They were triple the other budget. Compared to that other stuff, they were good-looking. But they had tremendous shelf life. Uh, the audiences increased. 
all of a sudden 40, 450 wasn't a bad figure for what they were doing. Well, because they were pulling in the numbers yeah. and uh, making money hand over fist. How, they did, what, about 95 episodes? How many episodes of that did they do? I think I've got it here somewhere. Yeah, they did, 90, they did 93 93 episodes of DuckTales and it ran from ran into early 1990 and it started way back in the olden times of October 87. That was another yeah. show we were doing. It started in uh, I think fall Baloo. of 87. Baloo was in this show and it was set in kind of a tropical island setting. It had to do with airplanes. I right. can't remember the Rescue name. Rangers. Rescue Rangers. Rescue Rangers, that's it. And, and he after ended that, up with his own show. Yeah, and Darkwing Duck was a big hit, too. <coughs> so, what was the atmosphere of Disney television animation in those days? You know, being in, being there when it's a little tiny place, yeah. and then it just explodes. We had 17 on-staff timers that I was giving work to, and another 10 that were working at home. We had a fellow who came up from San Diego, picked up a week's work and took it down there. Um, um, what do you it think? was hectic. It was big. There were six or seven shows going on. What do you think? What do you think made uh, Ducktales such a big hit? As you look back on it, was it was it the adventure? Was it the characters? Yeah, they they, they had very good uh, voice people, and uh, the time I was asking the timers to do what we had done to really look at that dialogue and, and phrase the dialogue. Uh, don't try to hold, we don't, we don't have to keep the cell count down, so if you think there's a special pose that works, make a little thumbnail of it, call for it on your sheets. They got a much fuller look. So yeah. the, the main studio was happy because within reason, we were keeping the same nature of animation that the nephews had been in before. In the theatrical shorts. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. And I don't know whether the kids at home felt they were getting more for their TV viewing time or not. I think it's a visceral thing. I think it's that, you know, people know when it's higher quality. Yeah. And, and, and they had some good producers thing. there. Uh, Alan Zasloff, very experienced fella. Carl Gears. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other producers. Uh, well, what, would, what would be the producers? What would they be in charge of? Just developing the stories and supervising the uh, Yeah, boards? they'd work with the script writer. And then they'd hand the board out to two or three people. They had some great board people, too. Uh, these people were bouncing back and forth between the, the main lot and, uh, and this TV studio. Yeah. I have a board that I've kept. I will, uh, when I throw everything else from animation out, I'm going to keep the board that was done by uh, Tom Enriquez. Right, uh, because he was, he was head of layout over at, at, at Disney Feature, <laughs> and he did a board. I said, "This should be a feature." I've never seen anything as good. How did he do this? There are people in the business who uh, don't draw the way I draw. I have to draw a frame, figure out what I want to do, and then come back and put some detail in. Some people just start at the top and finish. Mm -hmm. And Enriquez was one of those fellows. Mm -hmm. He told me that he learned when he was in the Navy, he just started drawing cartoon characters to kill time and found out he was pretty good at it. Um, anyway, it was, it was a great crew of people. And it became a career. Yeah, yeah. It was a great crew of people over there, a lot of talent in a, in a TV studio. Yeah. And that, yeah, that place grew like coffee. And they still couldn't get enough people. And Michael Webster said, well, I've got to find overseas facilities that can process this work at the quality level we need. Uh, Japan was costing a lot of money because the yen was going to the ceiling. Uh, he, got, he sent someone to Australia to see what was over there. He sent um, Bob Hathcock to England mm -hmm. to start a small studio, grab some people. Start. He sent me to Ireland uh, to work uh, with an art school. Because he says, uh, we're not going to get into a rating thing with either Murakami Wolf or Don Bluth, who was over there. Because right. that shoots the price of the talent through the ceiling. So we're going to train new talent. So I took a one-year assignment to go over there and set a school so you were, up. Talk about that assignment in Ireland. Um, it was a great school. And it was just that the, 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 what are they called? the Celtic Tiger was just rising, just the cub at that time. Uh, it was a very positive atmosphere. They felt 
there, there were a lot of companies. Kodak was there, Xerox was there, everybody was growing, and now Disney's in. I did four or five television interviews for RTE, and it was I did them because I wanted to let the students the, coming out of high school or in other uh, uh, trade schools know that there's a program here that we can teach you Disney-style animation. Yeah. They built in six months a studio with um, uh, 30 uh, drawing stations. Yeah. They used uh, an old borstal. And a borstal is the, the Irish name for a boy's prison. Uh, during the Troubles, they had to lock a lot of the young men up. So um, they wouldn't shoot at the, so British, they regulars. Shoot at the British regulars. And, uh, but after uh, Ireland became, at least the South became an uh, independent republic, they didn't need those uh, buildings anymore. And one of them had become a local community college, Dunlary oh. School of uh, Art and Design. Had a very dynamic uh, dean uh, there. Uh, Roisin Hogan was her name. And uh, she sat down and talked to Disney and convinced them that if they put a little seed money there, we'd get some government money uh, from the government and we'd get a program up. And they got a program up. I sent, sent them at the end of the year 12 scenes fully animated of one of the uh, DuckTales shows. Not a production show, an old show, to show what the kids could do. And they were happy. They were fairly happy. Um, although they shut the program down because they decided they were going to go with England. They were getting some work there and they needed to put some more work in. So I told my kids, go to England, go to England, get jobs. And they did. Uh, half a dozen of, them, dozen of them are working in town now. Wow. Uh, and doing pretty well. So some of them went back to Europe. Your students ended up uh, moving around the globe and prospering. Yeah, yeah. And the, I went back two years ago to the school because I'd heard Roisin had retired. Mm -hmm. And I went to the school, and it's ten times the size it was. Mm -hmm. They also do film and uh, and marketing, uh, advertising uh, programs. Uh, but they had uh, a full computer unit now, uh, and they have a wing with six rooms. And they have about 120 animation students, and I had 28. But you got the whole thing rolling. Yeah. I wrote a, uh, a what do they call them? A syllabus for all the classes that they should teach. And I had a couple of other teachers that work with me teaching some of the basics design. I had a good design teacher and a drawing teacher. Um, hmm. Yeah. Wow. That was a lot of fun. But then after the year was up, they decided to go to England. You closed. They you withdrew closed the funding. Facility. So they said, we can keep you on, but this is, this is the new pre um, weekly salary you're going to get. And I said, I can't stay here for that. Hmm. So I came back. Went back one more year at Disney um, TV, yeah. and then I followed a friend of mine who uh, had, he said, I need you over at uh, Film Roman on Garfield. Garfield's taking off, so I went over and worked with him. He's a very close personal friend, Vince Davis. He died uh, last year, um, and we did worked on a lot of shows together. We worked very well as a team. So how was the Garfield project to work on? Because that started at, at Bill Melinda's studio as a special, and then uh, Phil Roman yeah. uh, took the show because Bill couldn't do the series because uh, Charles Schultz yeah, was Jim, getting a little nippy about yeah, that. Charles Schultz and Dim, Jim Davis, they said, personally, I like the guy. He's a great cartoonist, but I want the best people working on my show. And they were sort of afraid, so they couldn't have two at the same studio. So... Bill so, said, told, uh, told Phil to go Phil, off and go ahead and start account. your own studio if you want, because, you know, otherwise we're not going to So what, what, was the, what was the work and the working atmosphere at Phil's little studio? Because he started on Riverside Drive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what was that like? Um, I, got, I got called in to work over there, and I, I turned it down. I think I had some other project I was in the middle of. Uh, well, yeah, that's right. Uh, I was a super. He wanted me to quit, and I said, "I'm the supervising animator, and I got a lot of strings in my hands. I really can't." What were you working on at the time they called you? I guess uh, Darkwing Duck. I was handing out and all of that. Um, then I went to Ireland. I came back, and uh, went back in. And now they had Marlene May was now the supervising timing director, so I was just writing shows, and it was all right. 
Uh, but Vince uh, said, if you could come over, we could still use you. So I decided to go over there. Um, Are they still on Riverside Drive at that time? No, no, now they're on... Um, Chandler. Chandler, yeah. That three-story building or something. And, and they've been growing exponentially. So uh, I had to give up my union benefits. You, you, went, but you went to Film Rowan, now a proud <laughs> union studio, was at that time non-signatory. That's right. But they had a, a 401k and a, and a good, fairly good health plan. Not as good as the IA health plan, but, you know, a, a substitute. Right. So uh, I did that for about five years. Uh, and I got to write the very first, what do they call it? Uh, uh, that, I'm just blanking. The show about the fellows from Texas that uh, Mike Judge did. Oh, yeah, you're talking about um, um, King of the Hill. King of the Hill, yeah, yeah. So you were on the first episode of that. I did, yeah, I worked on that. Uh, how was that up. to work on? Well, it was fun. Uh, I, they, they moved me down for three weeks uh, to uh, Century City, where Mike Judge had all his writers and everything. And I got to see what a craft table looks like. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, piled high. Yeah, and ca cappuccino makers and all this stuff that never were part of the animation scene at all in those uh, days. That's the live action, big time studio yeah. scene, not the <laughs> riffraff that. Uh, and I go in, and it was fun to sit in just to. S they said, sit in here and see if anything we're saying is going to be really hard to do in animation. And that was my job, to sit in a meeting. And so I just tell them, you're going to do a joke about World War II and you're going to have the Normandy landing. <laughs> uh, there's probably a way to do that, but I'm going to put some restrictions on you. Yeah. And so they'd say, well, the gag is so-and-so, we can do it with just three guys in a foxhole or something. You know? That was my input, just to tell them this we'll, is we'll work in animation. We'll, we won't show the entire landing. Yeah. And then uh, Vince got hired to go to Cartoon Network, which was the outgrowth of H&B. And uh, he had a show for me to work on, so I followed him over there. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and that was um, the Cow and Chicken Show. And that was a lot of fun. Dave Feast was the uh, producer. He'd been a board guy with uh, John uh, Cristalucci. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Ren and Stempy. And um, it was a crazy show, crazy scripts. And uh, they encouraged uh, all of us to try to do a board and then write the sheets. So it would yeah. be like the old days, a real constant flow of the same energy all the way through the project. And so I, I did four boards and wrote sheets for a lot of shows. So you're back storyboarding after years yeah. of being a time Every director. once in a while in my career I got a chance to storyboard. I took a class here at the Union. Kurt Anderson was the instructor. Uh, and I took it because the layoffs for timers would have us coming back in October or November. But if I was, I noticed the board people went back three months early. So I said, well, I'm going to learn to, to do boards the TV way, because I'd done boards when I had my own company, and at various places. So uh, I took Kurt's class, got some samples, took them to, uh, to Marvel, and got hired as a board artist. Huh. Uh, I think uh, Potato Head Kids was my first show. Um, Interesting, amazing. And then, I, of course, as soon as the timing came up, they moved me off over to timing, but it gave me a longer year. Uh, yeah, and you gotta you gotta <coughs> work and survive in this business. If you don't do that, then you're off uh, yeah, yeah. waiting tables somewhere or working working in the butcher shop at Trader yeah. Joe's. Yeah. So. If you want to be in this business, then learn. A, but Chenard was that way, and Cal Arts is that way. Yeah. About teaching you all the aspects. And, oh yeah. Yeah. And then, so when that gig ended. What was next on your agenda? Cartoon Network went quite a while. They moved from uh, being in the Warner Brothers building over on Sepulveda. <coughs> there was a gallery or something, and we took, went up six floors, and then we were in the Warner Brothers. They had three floors there. Um, I, I went on to uh, the Batman show. Yeah, yeah. I worked several that series was the Warner on that. Brothers. And Michael Gogan. Uh, who's a f an old friend, and Brian Hogan uh, brought me over on that show. And uh, I worked off staff, 
But uh, the whole timing crew was working at home, coming in, dropping it off, picking up more work, back and forth. But full union package, everything was fine. Huh. And uh, But that got more and more complicated every year with uh, all those effects, smoke, uh, extra, you know, secondary lighting. Uh, those shows became very glowing. Theatrical. Yeah, yeah, they wanted all that written on the exposure sheets, uh, and it was going crazy. They had, the, the, the boards are complicated, and they had a huge crew of checkers, timing checkers, to make sure we were seeing everything that were on the boards. Right. But sometimes we weren't. They were that complicated. And each board person would put information of what they wanted in a different place, and we had to kind of clue each other about this is how this board person works. Right. So that. It was complicated, but those were good shows. They were nice shows. And then you worked uh, back at Cartoon Network on The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Yeah. You yeah. were there for a dozen episodes. Yeah, it was uh, two full years. And uh, the third year, they decided they were going to change the style of timing on the show. So they brought in uh, Power Puff timers. And I said, you know, we could probably follow, do the Power Puff t t timing if you just give us a sample. But they said, no, thank said, you. No, 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 no. <laughs> thank, you for your, uh, thank you for your support. And then you kind of ended up... That gave me a chance, though. I was available, and uh, I got a chance to work on a feature, because I'd never drawn uh, Mickey or Donald or Goofy, uh, and I got to be, uh, along with John Kafka, we were the timing department on a, a feature director video called... Um, Twice Upon a Christmas. Oh, yeah. yeah. I that, think, uh, wasn't that Matt O'Callaghan was Matt the director? Matt O'Callaghan was the director, yeah. yeah. Matt's and uh, Madsen. Uh, so how producer. was that to work on? That was a lot of fun. It was 50% meetings. Uh, I think we were in our little double cubicle writing sheets a third of the time. One of us had to be in the meeting to... to to watch what other people were changing to see how that would affect the animation. Yeah. The other one had to be sitting with the editor because they were constantly revising for the four levels of approval committees that would come in. Yeah. Uh, so it was a very interesting year, year and a half to work it. We finally got the thing done and it looked pretty good. That was, wasn't that CG? Or was it that? was. It, uh, about halfway through they decided to go with CG. Um, but they said don't change the way you write the timing. It's the same situation. Except uh, they called me in the first time to look at some CG movement to mm -hmm. see if it was fit the sheets. So I've got the sheets and I'm waiting to see some kind of, I'm not what, what I'm going to see. Because I've only seen finished CG. I don't know what rough CG looks like. It looks like Lego blocks oh, yeah. sliding on rails. Oh, yeah. And they said, does, this, does the timing look good? What? <laughs> Doesn't look like anything to me. No, and plus they do it even. It, you know, so, so you can't see if the slow ins and slow outs are working. Just is he arriving when he should arrive? Is that what your sheets say? <laughs> so Matt says, just go with it. You know, tell him if they if something's wrong. But I know you can't make a real judgment. You know, Matt's been directing CG yeah. shorts at uh, Warner Brothers, and he's very good about listening to everybody. Uh, I came up with a couple of gag ideas. Uh, and they went into the picture. Alan Bodner, who was a, the, the color uh, designer, they said it would be funny if they did so-and-so. And Matt said, I'm going to board that. That sounds good. That's how he gets good production. He uses everybody in the room. He listens yeah. to everyone. Oh, know? yeah. Yeah. And you sort of finished up your uh, career working on The Replacements, another uh, a, a yeah. traditional hand-drawn show Yeah, yeah. At, uh, at Disney. How was that? That was like a half a season or so. I think I came in and the, and uh, and I was also I was picking up some Batman part time and that part time to put a week together, um, and that took me up. Uh, the, the replacement finished and then I worked Batman and um, three weeks before my chosen retirement date. Yeah, uh, Warner Brothers laid me off from the Batman. They said we don't have it. I said, can you what put you me on about another show for three weeks? You put me on another show for for three weeks. Uh, you know, I can I can cut sheets for you. What, a, you know, I did not have to be any creative, but let me work to my retirement date. Sorry, Dave. So you're I, done. I went home and I'm filling out my unemployment uh, 
report to, to go in there, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine, Jim Schumann, who I'd been bit with when he was first getting in the business. Yeah. Back at Film Roman, he is producing a show at Nickelodeon, and he said, "Come and write sheets for me for three weeks until you retire." So I did that, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, that was a CG show, um, but they let the timers have a lot of input about uh, what you know what what composition might make the gag a little funnier. This yeah. and that, or, or some emotion a yeah. little stronger. Yeah, and I'm going to end with uh, your five most inspirational pieces of animation that you either watched as a kid, an adult, that you worked on, that really uh, inspired you and drove your game higher. What Do you have any four or five pieces that uh, you can relate? Because we've had a lot of different answers over the course of the year that I've been doing this. Yeah. The first thing I remember seeing that really impressed me uh, was not a Disney feature. Most people probably say it's a Disney feature, but it was Disney. It was the Disney shorts in, uh, uh, is it Make, not Make My Music. Make they, My Music was one, two whistle, plunk, uh, and boom. Melody time. Melody time. Melody time. The, um, the, the reason? The, uh, I was very young, and uh, but I saw these characters are really connecting with me. I don't think I use those words, but I'd been looking at at Mighty Mouse and Little Lulu and those things that kind of sh they were showing you in theaters in the yeah, late forties. Yeah. But uh, the little story with Little Toot, how much you know he was uh, getting a sh the the short short end. Uh, the adults wouldn't understand him. I had that feeling about adults, and later I realized. The, the writers were playing on m my own experience, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Pecos Bill was. In oh yeah, beautiful. That's, an under, that's a really good yeah. underrated Disney short. Those were uh, really great it's shorts. Got smoking in it. That's the thing. Yeah. That's hysterical <laughs> for me. Yeah. Him rolling a cigarette and. Uh, I, if you have to pick things out that just seared into your memory, those two sequences in uh, uh, Melody Time. I've always stuck with me. When I was teaching classes, I would show those. I, I had a DVD of them, uh, and I showed them. Um, and then uh, there's a couple of UPA pictures, uh, the Gerald McBoing point, the use of color for emotion and, and simplicity of, of composition and selective, not limited animation, but selective animation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Rudy Toot Toot. And it was a great thrill to have T. He, who had been the designer of that, uh, be my uh, supervisor of, of my training program at Chenard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty so it sort of came Fifteen full years later, yeah. You're inspired by the work of people who teach you later. Yeah. So. Um, I, I've, there's probably some things that I, I... You know, there were a lot of independent cartoons that probably no one is going to see because they're owned by people who have gone out of business. But there are these little short films that were made in the 60s and early 70s by TV commercial studios. Yeah. Um, and uh, Murakami Wolf did some beautiful ones. Huh. Uh, and I got to be involved in, in, in some of those. Uh, and at the same time, and Corny Cole was designing on those. Um, uh, the, the, this one about it was a Boccaccio story. Um, Jack Hyder was a background artist, and they used uh, colors that related to the Renaissance yeah. tapestries. Uh, again, I blanked on the name. Oh, that's all right. Uh, it'll come to me. But I think we've covered the gamut. Okay. And David, I thank you for uh, your time here today and granting this interview, because I think it's important for... Uh, people to hear from uh, the guys that have uh, been in the business for 40 and more years, and you were certainly one of the leaders. So thank you very much. My pleasure, Steve. I'm glad you're doing this.